Giannis has, uh, has been in the power area for a long time. Uh, uh, I, I've mainly witnessed some beautiful, well, beautiful research on, on understanding the uh, dynamics of, of large, uh, large, large power networks. Um, and uh, I guess you know, he spent the last year in, uh, in government, actually, as an advisor in, in the UK. And now I guess you're back in, uh, in the uh, University of Durham. But, uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for in inviting me to this interesting workshop, and my apologies for criticizing you for not choosing oh, no. <laughs> the, the appropriate disciplines <laughs> here. Uh, so l let me just start with putting some thread through the previous pr uh, um, the presentations, how to lead to this one. I mean, in the welcoming speech by Mr. Lancelotti, he's mentioned my, uh, my presentation, and he thought that my unsynchronous wheat uh, approach will help him with golf, and he he professed to have no knowledge whatsoever about this area, while I profess, I profess to have no knowledge whatsoever about golf, which means if we could get together, we'd be perfectly ignorant about, it, about the whole thing. Now, the whole workshop is about definition of smart grids. And again, I think the second speaker mentioned that FERC, or is it NERC, came up with 37 definitions of, of, of sorry, only 23. So let me put the 24th one, which will be the easiest one, that smart grids are the words you put nowadays on any grant application. And it works. So I, I think that's much better. And again, I think it was David who, who mentioned about those, those inconvenient Kirchhoff's laws, or Kirchhoff's laws, as you, as you say them over here, which basically mess up the nice word, which would be you know, for economists and, and control theories and etc. Everything would be nice, like communication networks, if it wasn't for Kirchhoff's laws. And, and actually, that's the reason I've, I've decided, knowing who is coming over here, to stick to Kirchhoff's laws, because my background is power engineering. And I took a bet that there are very few power engineers around. So could I check how many power engineers are in the audience? One, two, two, three, maybe, maybe four. And that's good, <laughs> because, uh, because I mean, I, I do a lot of work on, on the on boundary between engineering, economics, I mentioned social science, control, and et cetera. But usually I talk to my fellow engineers, and then I can pretend that I know something about the subject. And I, wouldn't, I didn't want to come here to pretend that I know something about the, those other subjects being here where so many experts are. So I'll just stick to my guns, and I'll talk about hardcore power engineering in this, in this presentation. So as Sean mentioned, um, I'm with Durham University. I've spent the, uh, the last seven months with, with advising the government, the uh, Department of Energy and Climate Change, which is very much like your Department of Energy, but because we in Europe believe in climate change. So that's why there's, there's also <laughs> the climate change uh, uh, in, in the name of the institution. Uh, right, a few words about Durham. And this is the wrong kind of Durham, because probably you think about Durham, Northern Carolina is, is the main Durham with Duke University. Uh, I come from, from Durham in England, which is a beautiful town, northern town, when you go from London up there to, the, to Edinburgh, the medieval town with the cathedral and the castle. So I, I encourage everyone who comes over to England to, to visit Durham and me. Uh, so this is the third oldest university in England. Not in Britain, but in England, because some of the Scottish universities which are, more, which are older. But second, third in England after Oxford and Cambridge. And again, wrong Cambridge, not the Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's, it's Cambridge, England. Right, so what I'm go going to talk about. Uh, so I'm going about, as I said, about technical problems with high penetration of wind and PV. And I've met an inter in, uh, intervention earlier in one of the presentations. Again, first, I think, presentation. Uh, because, I mean, many people think that balancing for wind, for renewables generally, is the main problem with integration of, of, of renewable, uh, uh, renewable generation. And I don't think it is the main technical problem. As I mentioned, this is just economic problem. We know how to do it. We've been doing it since be the beginning of the power industry. We could do it with open cycle gas turbines. We can do it with storage, it's expensive. We can do it with the customer, active customer demand. We can do it with interconnection. It's just the question which one is, is the cheapest. But technically, it's not a challenge. We could do it. Uh, however, I'll be talking about real technical problems with, with high penetration of renewables. I'll use example of, of Ireland, because there are some interesting results coming from over there. And I think there are in, in, in important policy implications for, for, for GB, for Great Britain, where I come from, and for the other countries. And I'm talking about politics policy implication because, as I said, I've been advising the government for the last seven uh, months and so I came to realize how important it is 
to get those dumb politicians to do what they should do. Uh, so, uh, a great integration of renewable generation. I mean, many reports uh, uh, from all, in all over the world, uh, in this country, uh, in other countries, and the people look at the, at the examples of pen high penetration in some countries, like, like Spain, in Europe, it's Spain and Denmark, have very high penetration of, of wind, but basically they're part of the bigger power system, European power system. And my talk is really, what happens when you, have, when, when you are not dealing with large interconnections, AC interconnections, like in Europe or like here, I mean, you know the one on the left very well, the three big interconnections in this country. In, in, uh, while in Europe, Europe is more or less divided, this is the main continental uh, interconnection. There is Great Britain, Great Britain means um, United Kingdom without Northern Ireland, because here is Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland operates synchronously with, with Ireland. Uh, with the Republic of Ireland, and you have Scandinavia, and the rest. So, uh, with, with Denmark over there, and, and Spain over there, they're part of the bigger interconnection, and they can take advantage of, of being part of the bigger interconnection. The problem I'm talking about is how to manage when you have a small uh, AC island, which is connected uh, with the, uh, by DC lines with the rest of the system. I will think about America, I'm not sure, ERCOT, is it... Um, an island or the DC or AC links with the rest of the system? DC. So again, so I think so perhaps application what I'm talking about uh, could be to Texas, to ERCOT. Because they could be in a similar situation. I hear they have quite a lot of wind over there. Uh, so comparison of wind penetration, and again, I'm talking about the whole, not in a particular country or control area, I'm talking about the whole AC interconnection. Uh, so these are a bit old numbers from 2008. So if you look, for example, uh, uh, so this is the total generation capacity uh, in, uh, sorry, the first row in each, uh, this is the main European networks, this is the Nordic, GB, and Ireland. You can see Ireland is tiny. However, if you look at the wind, wind again is tiny in Ireland compared to, to Europe, but if you look at the percentage of the, of the capacity, it's huge. And, and that's why it's so interesting to look at Ireland, who is a small country, but percentage-wise, they have quite a lot of wind and they are operating as an island, similarly as, as, as Great Britain, but we, are, uh, we have much less wind. So island and GB, so as I said, both are synchronous islands. It means they're connected by DC links. Those blue lines are DC links uh, to other systems. And as I mentioned, the island already has a high penetration of wind and instantaneous feed-in can exceed 50% of demand at night, especially when the, when the demand is low, but wind is high, and I'll, I'll show you what, what happens, what they do. It's indication, and so Ireland is basically a good lab, because this indicate, they provide indication of the problems where others, including us, uh, can face in, in 10 to 20 years when there is more wind of the system. They've published a study, so I'll be showing a lot of results from that study, which is a variable available from, from AirGrid.com, which is the, AirGrid is the system operator. And already they are doing operational strategy, and there's a real technical limit, which I'll be talking about today, which is that spilling wind when instantaneous feed-in from wind is more than 50% of demand. They decided it's not safe to do it, and they spill wind, and now that's what I'll be talking about. In order to understand why is it happening, we have to step back and, and say a few words about synchronous operation of power systems. So these are kind of fundamental things which second year power engineering students do, but since there are only four or five power engineers in the audience, so I think maybe I'll go a little bit in details, in detail about it. So power system operation is based around traditional synchronous generators uh, which run thermal and hydro plants. And those they are just piece of, pieces of machinery which are called synchronous generators. And their operation is vitally important for the way power systems work. And one of the, the, the questions again today ask, you know, they don't understand why the system works as reliable as it does. And one of the reasons is that it is, it is because it's based around synchronous operation of synchronous generators, a lot of them. And this is important for frequency control. I'll talk a little bit about that charging dynamic stability. I'll mention it. And also voltage stability point of view. And the main problem we are, we, are, we are talking about when replacing traditional generators, traditional power stations, but wind and PV is that we are replacing synchronous generators with asynchronous ones for wind and PV, and this has profound effect on system operation. 
And I repeat, we need to consider, for, to, co to understand those repair effects, we need to consider uh, the whole AC interconnection. That means, for example, if you're looking at eastern or western interconnection, I don't believe you'll have those problems because you'll always have a huge fleet of synchronous generators. It's more of a problem for smaller systems like GB, Ireland, and ERCOT, perhaps. And the, main, the first problem is frequency control. So let's go through some basics, kind of slides which I do in the second year in my lectures, is how to, how to maintain a power balance. It means generator equal demand in an uh, AC power system. Uh, in a time scale of minutes to minutes, it means load following, as load changes goes up and going down. Balance of power is basically maintained by the power system generator, traditional, in traditional way, in the kind of Stalinist way, power system operator tells which generators to run. It can be done by control and command or can be done by economic means as, as in the power pool. But basically it is, it is through some kind of centralized control. And this is what's happening. This is, this is daily demand curve in, in, in Britain, for example. So basically as, as demand changes on the scale minutes to minutes, it can be done, it is done. But the question is for what happening is when there is instantaneous uh, uh, how instantaneous power balance, balance is maintained on a second-to-second -second basis. For example, what happens when a large power plant trips for whatever reasons? Are you size will be? Because size will be is the largest nuclear power uh, plant on the British system, 1.3 gigawatts. So what happens if you suddenly lose 1.3 gigawatts on a system which, uh, let's say, at night has a, uh, has, uh, is running at 40 gigawatts? So this is quite a large proportion of, of the total demand. Power system operator cannot react to it because it happens instantaneously. Uh, but what happens afterwards? Demand exceeds generation, but the lights stay on. So what, where does the difference, where does the balance come from? And the answer is it comes from AGC. Well, power engineers are not allowed to say anything, by the way. Where does it come from? Where does the balance of power come from? Basic physical thing. <laughs> come on, you are, you are engineers. Tell me, tell me where the balance come from. Guns comes from spinning masses, from inertia. There are a lot of generators spinning in the system, and what happens instantaneously after the the, the um, uh, uh, you lose large power plant, power system operator does not have time to react to it but there is a lot of inertia in the system, a lot of stored kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy is, is proportional to the speed squared, inertia times speed squared divided by two. And that kinetic energy provides a cushion for any momentary, it means second by second changes in, in the power balance in the system. So this is how it is done. And this is a diagram which I use for, this, with the system, for with the students. So this is referred to as load frequency control. So all those generators are, those cars are generators. And there's big wheel is the total power load, and those uh, the, the the those strings are electromagnetic forces which keeps generators synchronously running together, and basically the run and the constant speed. It means the frequency in the system is constant. So this is kind of conveys the man the, the the message of the load frequency control. So each of those cars is that is that synchronous generator. So what so let's go through the process. What happens when you lose a large power station? Uh, keeping that that uh, 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 that picture in mind. So what happens if you lose a, if you lose a power plant? All synchronous generators, all those cars, slow down because they they kinetic energy is turned into power, and that's, so by slowing down, they release this additional uh, energy to cover the power deficit. This slowing down of generator causes frequency to drop because frequency is basically the speed of operation of, of rotation. And the frequency drop activates turbine governors uh, on turbines. And so those turbines open valves to release more, more steam. Or if it is hydro power plants, there'll be gates, which let more power, let more, letter, more water uh, go through. And that, that means they start to produce more power and they start to restore the power balance. And this continues this process, which is referred to as the primary frequency control which primary frequency control is restoring power balance. Each continues under the frequency drop is halted. It means if the frequency is constant, it means that we have a balance of power, but the frequency will be lower than, than 50 hertz in Europe or 60 hertz in this country. Uh, so the primary frequency control, is, uh, it's important to understand, is fully automatic. No one intervenes with it because 
all generators, all power plants must be equipped uh, with turbine governors, with so-called drip characteristic. So those turbine governors, in all good old days, they were kind of water regulators. When we, the, basically, when depending on the on the speed, you know, that point would go up and down and activate the turbine governors. Of course, nowadays it's all uh, done electronically. And drop, it means this is this characteristic when there is a speed uh, versus power. So when the, when the speed goes down, the frequency goes down, more power is being generated in the system by each of those generators. And it's important that power stations basically have to operate derated to provide a headroom. That means that operation has to be more or less not at the, at the maximum because if it is required, they, have to, they must have a headroom to provide additional power should you lose a large power station. So that means they have to provide frequency control in power engineering uh, parlor. So that was the primary frequency control. It means restoring power balance. Secondary frequency const, uh, the control is restoring the nominal frequency. That means that the system operator, now is the system operator comes to mind, comes to action. Primary frequency control is fully automatic. No system operator uh, acts. Uh, for the secondary frequency control is the system operator uh, instruct power stations to increase the output in order to restore 50 hertz. And in, in this country and in Europe, it's automatic. It's, it's referred to as automatic generation control. Basically, there are some, some controls which basically tell which power station should come up and down. In GB, it's automatic. It's actually power system rings up power stations. System operator rings power stations to instruct them which, which should go up and which should go down. So that diagram illustrates that process. So here we lose the we, we lose uh, size will be a large power station. Frequency drops. So this is primary frequency control. Then it stops over here, recovers, it's constant. So this is uh, primary frequency control, fully automatic, decentralized. Then there's a secondary frequency control, which is restoring power balance. As you can see, it's very slow. Important thing is that the stabilizing, the, the, the first bit primary frequency control is about 30 seconds. So it's fully, it's pretty fast, fully automatic. Secondary fre frequency control, it takes minutes, five to 10 minutes, usually. Uh, so some, some diagrams, I use those kind of from, from my lecture to the students, so there are plenty of pictures. Uh, so the, the, the kind of analogy of that is that um, frequency control process, so you have some vessel with, with water and the level of, so that, that water is provided to inertia Level of water is the system frequency, so there's water flowing in, generation low water flowing out is demand, and in both are equal, of course, the, 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 the frequency level, it means the water level stays constant. If there is not enough generation, water will go down. If there is enough generation, if there is, uh, uh, demand is less than generation, water level will go up. And basically, you can use it, because the, the, you have some water stored in the, in, in the tank, which means you have some stored um, energy. Another, th another uh, 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 kind of mechanical cartoon type of explanation, it's, it's like you have a balance and you have a customers and producers, it should be 50 hertz, and the system operator desperately trying to, to bring it back to, to, to 50 hertz, or 60 hertz in this country. So you have frequency limits. To what extent, to how much you can allow the frequency to drop from its nominal level, 50 or 60 hertz? In GB is 52 hertz is upper operating limit, 47.5 is lower operating limit. Normal, you restrict it by 0.5 hertz up and down from the normal operation, so that's the maximum. If you have, uh, if you drop below uh, less, it means to 48.8, <coughs> then you, uh, under frequency load shedding starts, it means it starts to disconnect load because if frequency is low, it means uh, uh, generation does not cover demand and you're risking blackout. So you have under frequency load shed uh, shedding. Why you have those frequency limits? They are quite important and you have to stick to them. Uh, first of all, the design criteria for network and user equipment. If you go outside the limits, things may happen. Equipment may break down. Quality of supply and also you are risking frequency collapse. Because if the frequency drops too much, you have a positive effect. It means dropping frequency will cause more, more power plants to drop off because some of, of the equipment starts to, to drop off. And this is a, a diagram which illustrates that from Italian blackout in 2003, when they lost connection to Europe. So there was a huge deficit of, of energy. So those lines show deficit of energy because it's below zero, while the blue line shows frequency. So they had a huge deficit, automatic uh, under frequency load shedding started to activate. So over here, they recovered balance. Here is above zero. It means they were in positive. It, the, the frequ it, it, it was stopped. However, because frequency was low, more power plants started to drop off 
and there was a blackout. So there is a danger if you go too low with the frequency, it will start this positive feedback effect. So you have to stick to frequency limits, basically. So that was the traditional operation. Now let's talk about uh, impact of wind and, and PV and solar on, on, on the power system operation. So as I said, traditional power system operation, synchronous machine. When you connect wind and when you connect PV, you connect asynchronous uh, uh, power sources. Now, wind farms use either induction generators, which are different type of generations than the, the synchronous generators, or so-called double, uh, double fat induction generators, uh, and they react weakly to frequency changes, uh, which ef uh, effectively they'll have smaller inertia. The reason being, for example, this is double fat induction generator, so this is kind of normal electrical connection, but additional, it, it, it will have power electronics converter, which takes some power of rotor, and fits to the system. And the aim of that system is to maximize power capture fr from the wind turbine. So it will, so basically that system does not react to the changes in frequency, it will react to the changes in the wind power to optimize power capture. So that system is not, ve is not responsive to frequency changes. So it means the whole load frequency mechanism is distorted. Another diagram, kind of pictorial representation of, of that frequency control system. So if you think all those traditional synchronous generators, they'll be driving this common shaft, which is the power system, and they're connected by chains, which means that any, uh, um, any, uh, any change of speed with which the shaft rotates changes the amount of power produced by, by, those, uh, by those generators. It's a, it immediately affects. While the, the, the wind generators, which are those, are connected by elastic, elastic bands. Elastic bands, it means they still provide power to the system, but if, if the speed of rotation of the shaft changes, the elastic band will make, basically, the decoupled. For the certain amount of time, they will be effectively decoupled, they'll produce as much power as they did before. Which means that those wind generators do not provide inertia to the system. The effective inertia of the system as the whole is less. And here are some, some uh, is it happening really, or is it just a theoretical construct? So this are again results from this Irish study. So this is uh, inertia duration curves uh, at the moment and in 2020. So you can clearly see there's a downward shift of total inertia on the system. So what was the, so now the question is, what, so that was wind. What about PV and, and also DC connections to other systems? Well, PV obviously is, is, doesn't have any inertia whatsoever because nothing rotates. At least with wind generators, there is something rotates. It is just weakly coupled. You have wind turbines, which, which has inertia. It is just, it, 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 it's, it's not connected in, uh, by free, load frequency mechanism with the rest of the system. PV has no inertia whatsoever. It's a power, basically, you have, you have PV panels produce DC electricity, and you have power electronics converters, which convert them in, into electricity, no inertia whatsoever. Uh, if you talk about DC links connecting to power systems together, there will be those huge converters, which is a picture of one of them, and again, they do not react to frequency changes. DC links transmit as much power as, as you want, but it will not react to, to the, the amount of power does not react to frequency changes. So the overall effect of, of connecting more renewables to the system is that the lower inertia, you have less inertia. It means if you, have, if you take into account the same drop of, of, of large nuclear power station with a system of low inertia, what it will cause? It will cause the frequency to go down much more dramatically, and it may cause it to, that drop to be outside uh, uh, statutory limits. It means you cannot allow it to happen. If it drops too much, it, will, it, it may even cause a frequency collapse because the drop in frequency will, will be too high. So what can we do about it? And now you're talking about the smart grids is, well, the, sim the simplest thing, which the Irish do at the moment, I'll come back to the end, is just restrict wind and PV feed-in. I mean, in Irish, of course, it's wind because they don't have you know, any sun whatsoever, so I'm, I'm not talking about it. <laughs> The PV. Any Irish in the audience? Yes. So, as I said, overall effect of the lower system inertia is that the, 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 the frequency drop can be uh, can be outside the statutory limits. 
Well, I, I did that before. Uh, yeah. So now let's go to the mitigation uh, measures. So these are smart grid measures. How, what, is it an absolute technical limit? Of course not. We are good engineers. We know how to deal with problems. We don't know, as I said, how to deal with people. Uh, but uh, we are all autistic, I would say, to some certain extent. But we know how to deal with machines. We don't know how to. If there is a technical problem, there must be a technical uh, a fix to that problem. And of course, there are a number of technical fixes to it. So let me go through some of them. The first technical fix is to provide so-called synthetic inertia. And basically, because as I said, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at the wind power station, wind turbines, it has physical inertia because it's something it rotates, big masses rotate. The problem is it is not coupled to the, to the frequency, does not re react to frequency changes. But uh, if, we, if you look at this double fat induction generator, it has some power electronics. So what we could do theoretically, and some manufacturers think about it, is uh, we, c we can program those power electronics link provided with some signal from, from the grid about frequency so that that power electronics will extract more power from the rotor and basically <coughs> will provide if frequency drops it means it will provide this, this inertia so this is called synthetic inertia because it, it, it links with the with basically you, it, it is programmable it's not a natural phenomenon you have, uh, you have, uh, you have to program it so basically it will be artificially slowing down of the turbine in order to provide uh, uh, additional power. It is possible manufacturers uh, uh, do some trials about it, but uh, they have not used it. So we don't know whether it will work or not. Uh, the, the, the policy question is, again, um, I'm with the with Department of Energy and Climate Change. The policy question is, if this is a real thing, maybe uh, uh, it should be great code obligation of all the new turbines to have those capabilities on the, on, on defix. It is possible. The question is, is it real or is it nil? And, and do, we, do we really need it? The other mitigation measures is, well, what this conference is all about. It means it's, it's the customer the, uh, response. We have fridges. So when I was talking about lack of storage in the system, as, 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 as Sean pointed out to me, I was wrong because there is there is, of course, a lot of storage, but I don't mean traditional storage with electrical engineers think about controllable storage. Uh, uh, but basically, a lot of, there's a lot of storage with, with the customers. And that is basically thermal storage. So when you have fridges and when you have uh, air cons, what you can do, you can have controllers on them. And there are plenty of um, uh, uh, attempts about it, to do it in, in, the, in, the, in the all different countries. So those uh, clever controllers, when they sense the frequency drop, they will basically switch off a fridge or aircon for a few minutes. I mean, a few minutes is nothing. They, they, there's a lot of thermal inertia in them, so they can perfectly happy uh, uh, continue to work, and no one will notice anything if it's just a few minutes. Remember, time is important. Frequency response, we are talking not about hours. We are talking to helping the grid to get through difficult problem over, five, over two to five minutes. That's all. Nothing will happen to your beer in the fridge. And nothing will happen. You you will not uh, uh, even feel anything if your aircon goes off for for a couple of minutes, two to five minutes. The problem is, which I mentioned before, is it socially acceptable? Do we need Stalin to tell everyone? Well, basically, again, kind of regulations that basically that all the fridges must have them, and also all air, con air, air conditioners must have them, or should we let it to people to decide about it? And I have some doubts if you go for the for the latter. And that so technically, is it, never mind the regulation part, but technically, is that expensive? No, it's not expensive. I mean, depending if you do retrofit, of course, it, it is expensive. But basically, come on, additional controller, how much does it cost? A few dollars. But it doesn't, right, it doesn't damage the equipment. No, it doesn't damage. It's just additional controller. You just, it controls the, the, the cooling cycle. Not, Sorry? Not what the reason not to require for future. Well, th this is a policy question. Right. I always say engineering is easy, politics is difficult. Because if you have a, if you have technical pro problem, give me a few good PhD students, I can solve it. It may be very expensive, but I can solve technical problem. But this is a policy problem. Should we? And this is the previous as well. You know, do should we have a regulation which makes everyone, every fridge, basic requirement for all the manufact manufacturers to equip them with it? Technically, it's not a problem. Cost-wise, it's not a problem. You're just getting acceptance for it. Yes, there was a question over there. I may not be aware that EPA has to 
updated to the Energy Star uh, system so that uh, they get a, a credit, so I think credit for making the refrigerator demand response ready. Well, the well, demand response ready so that it's so that it's. Uh, <laughs> how about that? You just throw your hand up. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but now there's a lot of discussion going on to understand what does that mean? What does demand ready mean or grid connected ready mean? Uh, but depending on the programs, now with our traditional uh, pager based systems, maybe we couldn't do it. But with new smarter grid systems, maybe we could. But get the signals out, and, and so I just want to point out there is some work. Right now, through EPA is, is where it's being looked at as part of the Energy Star, which is a voluntary program. But Energy Star has a pretty good brand uh, with it, so that's, that's one area being looked at. I know that in Britain there are some trials, and of course those fridges are called, guess how? Smart fridges, of course. Everything is smart nowadays. So, so basically, you get a discount. If you buy a device with this, with this thing, you'll get some discount. The whole question about um, economics of it, cost effectiveness, and et cetera, and et cetera. But I think if it is treated as a common good, as a service, kind of policy type of things, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And it's everywhere. Yeah. So frequencies is a great signal, yeah. As I said, it's, it's not an engineering problem. <laughs> it's politics and, and economic problem, of course, as well. The next uh, uh, issue, which is important, especially for an island, physical island like Britain or, or Ireland, is that we, we have links to our neighbors, but they're DC links. And as I said, DC links do not react to frequency. The power trans it is just energy transfer, does not react to any, any frequency changes. But if you think about it, you know, next to Britain, there's huge Europe. And this Europe has huge inertia. Frequency control is not a problem in Europe because it's so big. They don't even think about this. Well, it is a big problem for us. So basically, it's quite simple. Why don't we make those, uh, those AC, DC converters, which are on both sides of the, of the interconnectors? It is, again, perfectly possible from a technical point of view no problem whatsoever with, with the new generation of, of, of so voltage source control converters to make them responsive to frequency changes. So basically what we would make, we would make those DC lines to behave like if there were AC lines from the control point of view. So that would mean that you would provide frequency response from Europe to Britain. And it's even better because uh, not only will the frequency response shared, but basically, remember, there are huge costs of it, there are huge um, uh, savings of that because if you think about it, if you're going back, you know, why Europe, which consisted of individual countries, got connected together, the main economic driver was sharing frequency reserve, sharing reserve. Because this, if every country has to provide reserve on their own, like Britain has at the moment, it costs a lot of money. If you pull your resources together, it costs far less. So it would be huge uh, uh, cost savings for, for Britain and for Ireland if we could share our frequency reserve with Europe. Technically, it's no problem, but as usual, the main problem is politics. It's not, well, getting in Europe to agree everyone to something is, 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 is forget about it. So uh, also, it's our technical changes because that would mean connecting another country to European interconnection, so there's a, all the harmonization issues. You know, as I mentioned, frequency control is done differently in Britain than, than in Europe, so it will be huge cost implication of getting to that. However, from the technical point of view, it is perfectly doable. And so that was frequency response. Uh, other problems with, 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 uh, uh, with asynchronous generation is transient stability. Uh, so transient stability is ability to restore operation following a fault. So what happens, you have, a, you, you have a transmission network and there's a fault happening 
and then generators start to oscillate against each other, the question is, will they return to, to stable operation after that? I don't have time to speak uh, much about it, but if you are interested, there's this very good book uh, on the market. If you may notice the second author, if you let me make the quick uh, uh, sales pitch. And the, the, again, pictorial explanation is you can think about those genera generators uh, um, uh, oscillate against each other because those, those, the synchronous torque which keeps them operating together is, is a little bit spring-like, uh, which basically you can use this kind of uh, uh, diagram. And uh, so when there is disturbance, they start to oscillate. However, that diagram does not convey that the torque is proportional to the sign of the angle. Torque is, uh, the, the force is proportional to the extension. So basically, it is nonlinear and it may cause a loss of stability. And now, what, where is the problem? We know perfectly well how synchronous generators operate in transient stability. There's a lot of work on modeling it using all kinds of uh, functions, Lyapunov functions, and co control theory has, has had a lot of input into that. We know how to do it, and we have been doing it. If we replace synchronous generators with, with induction generators, double fat induction generators, again, the mechanism of production of synchronous torque is different. So again, it changes dynamic properties of the, of the system, which may pose a threat. Again, there is a fix about it, because you have those additional control properties of, of, of DFIC, which means, again, you can control it, so it starts to, to simulate synchronous generator, produce torque in a similar way, but it, ha it, sh it has been shown that it could be done, but actually how it would work in practice, uh, uh, no one has done it. So the question is, will the synchronous be restored following a fault uh, when, uh, when there is a high penetration or wind and PV? This is a, actually a problem which no one has tackled yet. I'm not aware of, of any paper about it. I started to think about it, but uh, um, didn't have really time to follow it. It's an open question. If you're, if you're looking for PhD thesis on something, this is a good one. The next problem which used uh, with, with the high penetration of renewables is something which used to be a problem, but it is not anymore. This is fault right through. Uh, the, the significant problem at early stages of wind expansion. So if you have a, there was a picture which was published by E.ON, uh, the German utility. If you have a fault in the system, the voltage would go down and that would cause uh, a wind to, uh, generators to, to trip off uh, due to the low voltage. However, again, clever engineers have come up with a trick. So basically now all the new generators, connect, wind generators connected to the system must have this fault right through capability. So there is a regulatory solution to it, grid code solution to it. So that fits back why I'm talking about it. Because the, you could do it if you know there is a problem. So the same with frequency. If all the fridges and everything else had those devices, there would be no problem. So the problem is, uh, would be solved. So grid code requirement for fault right through uh, capability. Next problem is voltage stability. Now voltage, again, is, is the issue about voltage stability is connected to the reactive power. And at that point, uh, everyone goes, oh, reactive power. And then they don't know really what it is. People are use different uh, uh, analogies. You know, some people use uh, beer, which is kind of nice pictorially. Again, I don't have time to talk about what reactive power is. Important is that in order to keep the voltage in the network, you need the, that, that thing which is called reactive power. And that reactive power is, is, is to do with any motors. Any, any motors re require reactive power. You have to provide them. And you can provide it by synchronous generators, or you can provide reactive power by, by capacitors. But generating the power system, again, synchronous generators are the main source of reactive power. Which means what will happen if you replace synchronous generators by other types of, by asynchronous generators? Those double fat induction generators, which are the most common ones, have some limited reactive power production capability, but it is limited. It's not as good as synchronous generators, but you can kind of go, go around it. Uh, DC-AC converters at PV may produce reactive power, providing that the controller is appropriate. Again, not, uh, so it is, again, can be, can be solved by, by some technical fixes. So it is not a big problem. So the, the, the conclusion is for higher wind penetration may require additional uh, compensation, reactive power compensation to keep the voltages up. Uh, so now let's come to the, so the conclusion of my talk. So, so the, the air grid, which is the Republic of Ireland and Sony, which is the, it's, it's not the Japanese company, what you, you might think, it's the system operator of Northern Ireland. So this is Northern Ireland system operator. 
They have done that study and they've analyzed all those issues and they divide it um, into, into fundamental issues, which basically there are no solution at the moment. Uh, fundamental issues that need further analysis, so they may cause a problem. And this is basically the rest is issues that can be mitigated and non-issues. So the main issues, which are the main technical limits for, for high uh, penetration of, of wind and solar, is frequency stability, loss of largest infit, which is what I was talking about. And also so sh uh, fundamental issues, frequency variation and temporary loss of wind power due to network faults, which is transient stability. And also what they have done, so this is things which I'm talking about. And they have come up with this nice diagram, which I keep sh showing everyone, in, especially in the Department of Energy, because they have not been aware of that. So that diagram shows uh, a limit on the wind penetration. As I said, for Ireland is just wind, not PV. Uh, as the function of, of, of wind, uh, so, uh, of safe operation as the function of the wind infit. So on the x axis you have wind, on the, on the y axis you have demand. And you can see this is the line going at 50%. So basically, the, anal the analysis have shown that up to 50%, we are in the green, we are okay. If we go above 50 demand, 50%, this th things start to get dodgy, 75% extremely dangerous. So this is the reason why they already spilling wind when uh, wind infit exceeds 50% of demand, which happens at night. Uh, and they could, they think they could push to 75%, but that would be extremely dangerous. And remind you, remember, this is just for wind. If we talk about, if you add PV to that, to the picture in the kind of sunny climate, the, the situation could be much worse. Yeah. So it's a 50% with mitigations you mentioned or without mitigations? No, this is without mitigations. They don't have. So all those mitigation measures are we talking about, this is concept, at the moment they're conceptual. I've been to presentation. Of course, grid operators over there know about it. They, ha they are doing some studies. So basically with those mitigation measures, th they think they could push from 50% to 75%. That's right, you could. But they think even with those mitigation measures which I've been talking about, you cannot push above 75%. So 75% is the hard limit of the wind penetration. No, but this, the, the issue is, free, is, is synchronous operation. It's, 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 not, uh, uh, it's not balancing. Why not 100%? No, you cannot go 100% because if you have a double fault on the transmission network, the system would fall apart if you don't have synchronous generators which keep it together. Right? And also the frequency drop would be, would be too dramatic. So when the frequency drop, as I, so basically, so that, that's the studies have shown that you can push with those mitigation measures, you can push to 75%. But you cannot, there are fundamental limits at 75%, you cannot go above it. Yeah, you have conclusions? <laughs> so ba well, basically conclusions is that the high wind and, and PV penetration poses significant technical challenges, not balancing, forget about balancing. Not a problem in large AC interconnections, so it's good news for you over here, I suppose. But it's a big problem for, for Great Britain and Ireland. And uh, uh, main problem is, as I said, managing system stability following a large infit or network, network fault. Thank you. Um, the question is, is your 50% 75, is that generalizable or is that just Ireland? Oh, this is a very good question. That study has been done for the Irish power system and people in Britain ask me the same, exactly the same question. Is it, well, I think it, you'd have to do a uh, system by system study because that, was, uh, that study was done simulating the whole power system and they, they've come to that, to that conclusion. But it looks like 50% you know, is a nice number, right? 75% is a nice number. So maybe 60%, maybe 40%, but that sounds kind of you no know, right. And I have a suggestion for a field trip. Uh, the Big Island in Hawaii is up to 30 to 40 percent wind, and they have a much smaller, you know, uh, demand than uh, Ireland. Mm -hmm. So it, it may be very much system specific. Yeah.
Thank you.